Okay, and welcome back. And here we are in spring 1852. And um, it's been a, a mixed bag of a winter, I think. Uh, I mean, Rob, see, right up into December, uh, I was kind of um, serializing the Aiden crisis. And, and let's revisit Aiden to see how things have gone since then. So as we left off, um, Hussein Avni uh, forced a landing at Hodeida, and we managed to uh, ostensibly lift the siege at Hodeida and Sana. Now... Since then, what has become apparent is that Aden, um, the Aden of March 1852 is not the Aden of 51 or 1850. We are in decidedly hotter water. Um, it's, this has now become a much tougher proposition. Um, after lifting the siege of Sana, Kershid's cavalry uh, division pressed south into Taiz uh, with the aim of lifting the siege on the small colonial fort on the south south coast there, actually at Aden, which has incredibly uh, survived. It still exists and has been besieged since, I think, October, November last year. Um, it was a force of 400, I think probably reduced to 300 now. Yeah, just that. Um, now, what is becoming apparent is that... Um, these these boys are doomed sadly um there's not much more that we can do than what we have done to sort of relieve their situation and uh i would be astonished if they survived another month or two uh Kershid pasha's force pressed into taze and engaged uh the now uh, significantly enlarged and animated yemeni its insurgency in running battles um we won two or three in the last couple we've lost although in each battle, the casualties are about the same. So the loss being merely that we were forced to withdraw from the field. This is a pretty significant turn of events. Even before these defeats, what was really clear now is that um, this is um, it's a much more serious insurgency that, we're, that, 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 you know, that, that we are facing now than we were only six months ago. Since the rebellion, uh, we have much more effective, much much more numerous forces, and they've been combined now with the irregular kind of columns have kind of uh, coalesced and achieved force concentration around Aden and lending their support. These forces are much tougher. I mean, in any single battle, we're losing a thousand, two thousand, three thousand soldiers. We lost three thousand men on, in, in landing at Hodeida, and, and that has actually continued. That's been a theme. Uh, now, bear in mind that any single battle that we've had here in the last three months, we would have endured more casualties in a single engagement than in the combined losses of anywhere else in any theatre in the Ottoman Empire since January 1850. And let's, let's remember that last year we had a rebellion of 30,000 um, that formed um, around Smyrna. This was fairly decisively and quickly defeated with the loss of, of probably less than a thousand men, maybe about a thousand men. Uh, but this was very quickly and easily put down with overwhelming force. Uh, we're losing a thousand to three thousand every single engagement. And this accounts for Kershid Pasha's need to withdraw now. This uh, force has experienced some, some level of attrition. Supplies are becoming quite depleted and, and this force is now becoming quite disheveled and worn worn down. So um, Kershid's cavalry division is falling back to Sana with the aim of re-entering the colonial fort. And for the foreseeable future, he's going to be holding tight there and uh, reorganizing, regathering his strength, allowing for replacements. All replacements that arrive in this theatre, of course, are going to be trickling down the Red Sea this is a very, very long way for replacements and supplies to come. We'll probably send um, one of the supply detachments from Hussein Avni's force um, to link up with this uh, cavalry division, uh, just to bolster um, Kershid's supplies once he reaches Sana. But yeah, it, it's um, it's becoming significantly tougher, this 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 fight. And I suppose we've reached a bit, a bit of a fork in the road. As all of this happens... I'm kind of hearing my own voice echo in my head from January 1850 that we will not be engaging in any kind of <laughs> pro protracted insurgency in the Arabian Peninsula. And here we are doing exactly that. And the fork in the road offers, uh, well, two options, doesn't it? Uh, we either pack up, give up on Aden now until a much later date when we're in a really strong position to revisit in force, uh, having probably consolidated Hajez and developed the region significantly. By which time it's, it's quite likely the British would have made some inroads into Aden. Or we stand and we fight and we continue uh, with what we're doing. Uh, with the forces that we have at our disposal in the region, and we cannot really expand on this force much more. We already know that this is really the logistical limit of what we can supply at this point in time. So 
Yeah, a bit of a tricky one. Um, I think, uh, I mean, we've invested a lot in, in the region. And also, this is not merely some sort of prestige nonsense. Uh, this region is desirable precisely for the commodities that are accessible here. These are lucrative commodities, which we don't have great domestic access to, especially coffee. Uh, so I think that um, based on the investments that we, we have here, the assets we have, and we've invested in building a depot, a colonial fortress, a mission, trade outposts, which give us a nice trickle of these commodities into our economy, I think we need to protect our investment and um, at the very least hold these two sort of territories for the time being. The hope is that once Kershid Pasha's forces recovered somewhat, we can um, re-sortie to the south and begin to conduct operations and perhaps um, reposition ourselves in Aden. Aden is the next location that we want to really build up. This is the colonial capital in the last analysis, even though Sana is the most populous region so i think that we are going to stay for the duration there are some side benefits in the last analysis to this insurgency okay it's costly it costs men and equipment and so on and so forth but it does provide these very junior office with uh, officers with with really important uh, combat experience and one of the features of this early ottoman army is that it is a very new raw fresh army this is not the army that dates back to the kind of 13th century the ottoman army that uh, we inherited in 1850 is, is brand spanking new it, it's uh, you know it's the the Nazim al Shadid, it's, it's the sort of new model army, uh, modeled on kind of Western European traditions and experience. And um, it's very different from any Ottoman army that anyone would have faced before. It's only it's only about 10 years old, and it means that most of the officers are very new, they're very they're very junior, but the junior officers in particular are on the whole capable and resourceful men. And we want these guys to have experience because we want the future Ottoman army to be led by precisely these kind of experienced uh, characters. So there is, a, there is a benefit to this. Um, we have to give a little bit of thought also to what happens in the event of a significant war breaking out in the north, either against Russia or Austria. And my thinking is that, you know, I mean, this is not a large force that we have here. It's what, um, 16,000 plus, you know, we're, we're talking 20, 22,000 soldiers in the last analysis, maybe 15 of those being in the teeth arms. Um, so in the event of a real crisis in the north it's not as though this is a large number of forces that we have deployed here uh, but we certainly would want we would want our leaders exfiltrated from this region and, and taking commands in the north because these are both quite effective commanders i think realistically uh, without these leaders these forces would be much less effective they wouldn't really be able to conduct very effective combat operations they would incur a significant command penalty so it's quite likely that in the event of a large war to the north we would probably then have to practice a bit of a collapsing bag and to exfiltrate our forces. Maybe if we can keep a toehold at her die, they're using our marine division. Um, but we'll sort of fall off that bridge when we come to it. Um, it's food for thought, though. And the reason I suggest that is because on the horizon now, we're hearing the kind of distant sounds of gunfire. Um, the world in 1852 is becoming uh, more unstable, less predictable. And um, the first war, of course, um, that, that sort of triggered, um, I think, last year, um, or perhaps at the end of 1850, I'm, I think it was the beginning of last year, actually, was, was the, the Prussian invasion of Holland. That continues. No one has come to the aid of the Dutch. And Prussia occupies most of the, uh, of the country. Uh, they don't have any legitimate claims on Dutch territory, I don't think. So it's likely that um, if they're likely to press anything, they, they'll probably press for some kind of economic concessions, reparations, something like this. Uh, but we'll keep an eye on that situation. Um, the other significant uh, foreign event, of course, is the Taiping Rebellion, the Chinese Civil War, which has been raging since, um, I think, summer, spring last year. And that is now really, really, we're starting to see areas actually controlled um, by, by the rebels. We're seeing signs of pillaging and, and this kind of thing. And whilst China is, despite being a very large empire, somewhat marginal to world affairs at this time, um, it is an area of particular interest to the British, who we uh, are looking to um, sort of cultivate as an ally, and also to the Russians, a potential foe. So we do need to keep an eye on what's happening in China and the Chinese Civil War, because it, it could draw in other powers who may be significant to us. Now, the other significant event, which started only a few months ago, is Russia has invaded Sweden. No one has come to the aid of Sweden as yet. We've sent diplomats to Sweden to try and organize a state visit, to try and develop better relations with uh, the Swedes. Um, this could be interesting for us. So the, I mean, the, the Russian army is, if we look here, 2-3-1. Two, two, so it means it's basically just over twice the size of our army. Um, our army is roughly com comparable to the Prussian army. 
which may seem surprising, but Prussia is, uh, despite being very powerful, it's a very small state at this time. We have an army that is larger than Piedmont Sardinia. Um, the, the Austrian army is a little bit more powerful than ours, but the, the, the Russian army is, is, is more than twice as strong as ours. That's something we need to keep an eye on. And if Russia is at war with Sweden, and this becomes a protracted war, which ties down Russian troops, maybe a half or a third of their army, this benefits us for obvious reasons. Uh, so we do want to keep an eye on this. Worst case scenario, of course, Russia uh, gives Sweden an absolute hiding, uh, defeats them wholesale very quickly. This would then give Russia um, a large national morale boost, which would make them a bit of a tougher opponent in the event of a war with us. And we do suspect that that is coming. Uh, we're seeing now large concentrations of Russian forces. Our intelligence on this force is actually very good. I mean, we can see that it's comprised of four army corps, uh, one cavalry division, two brigades, I would guess Sapa Nagaya, uh, probably sappers and pioneers. Uh, I, can't, I can't speak Russian, but I would guess that's the case. And a supply detachment also. This is quite a large force. Slightly larger than that commander should be in command off. It, it has a small command penalty of 12%. Um, but the fact that that is uh, sort of gathered here in, in this region for no obvious reason, and the fact that we're seeing also another significant Russian deployment, we have less information here, of course. This terrain makes information quite difficult. Uh, weather is quite tough here as well at the moment, but uh, we also know that this is fairly substantial. So, yeah, things are. Uh, we think things are probably afoot with Russia. We think that Russia has some kind of plan, possibly for this year, next year, maybe not for the next few years, but we think that something is definitely in the works. And we're going to keep a really careful eye on this. We have begun to take some steps. Now, a lot of our state revenue over the last two years has been focused on really consolidating colonial regions, principally Libya, which ended up being twice as expensive as it should have been because of a failed attempt at colonizing. And also, of course, we had to uh, take the SNAP decision to push for protectorate status in uh, Qatar, which was successful. Uh, that has been converted into a protectorate. We're keeping an eye on kind of uh, Dubai. Um, at the moment, the British have no colonial penetration here, but in any case, this has been the principal kind of demand on our exchequer, really, um, has been kind of colonization. We've not done too much insofar as military expansion, because we also had a very small, fragile economy to begin with. We didn't want to uh, uh, impose significant demands. The economy is quite a bit larger now. If we're looking at domestic market sales, we'll go into that in, in a bit of detail on provide a full economic report in a moment. But uh, I think we're in a position now where we can start expanding the armed forces. And we have done just that. We've begun the construction very quickly of a militia corps. Uh, now, we can only build militia corps at the moment. Our technology sort of prohibits anything else. Even though these are militia, uh, because it's a corps with an independent HQ and uh, full artillery support, this would not be considered an irregular force by any stretch of the imagination. Rather, we would say that these are conscripts. Um, they're formed very, very quickly. They're, they obviously will have significant combat penalties. Uh, they will have quite a low level of organization and morale. However, um, these will gradually transform into regular infantry, uh, which is good, which is really, really important. So we're going to try and get these built early, give them a nice kind of um, <coughs> head start, uh, give their, the officers a bit of a head start in kind of... Um, in, in developing this force into something a bit more serious. We do intend also to build another one or two infantry corps. The aim is to stockpile one or two infantry corps inside the citadel of Adrianople. The reason being is because in the event of a war in Europe, we want to begin to build up a little bit of a strategic reserve in the event that our main imperial army under Ritsa Pasha, in the event of war, we would intend to fold in Abdul Karim Nadir's force, which is two cavalry divisions, into this army, we would probably remove an army corps and uh, pop that into Adrianople, combined with an additional corps which we intend to build. That, will, that Those two corps will be our strategic reserve. And then we will have a field army with a bit of combined arms. We'll have some cavalry. And we'll probably have three or four commanders. We'll probably look, look to bring up uh, Omar Pasha into the main Imperial Army also. And the main Imperial Army will obviously move north to interdite or try and deal with any kind of invading Russian force, which is which, which you can see a likely invasion force here. And we will have a strategic reserve. So in the event that whether we are victorious uh, or not, we, it's likely that Ritsa Pasha's army will experience some casualties, of course. And we would look to basically remove 
any one of these cores that are particularly depleted, the most depleted core, in a given battle, we could easily sustain 20 or 30,000 casualties. If that is heavily sort of uh, bent towards one particular core, we can remove that core out, switch it in Adrianople with one of a reserve core, and this will allow Rita Pasha's force to maintain comparatively good health. It will mean that at any one time we will have um, one core in Adrianople as a reserve, one being reconstituted, and hopefully as fresh a possible a force as we can have in the field fighting Russia, or possibly Austria. Uh, we, we're always getting reports of Austrian kind of build-ups on our border. They tend to move, however, and, and they tend to be quite short-lived. So we suspect that the, Russia, that the Austrians, rather, are just kind of moving forces around the border, probably trying to gather some intelligence and whatnot. That's it in terms of military report. At some point, what I think I might start doing is once every f few years, I'll do a special video which focus on, focuses a bit on the military, and we'll do a, um, a complete military report. The purpose of this would be to kind of um, provide insight into our order of battle, uh, more detailed military plans, and uh, depending on who we fight, and plans for our military, and can also keep any viewers abreast with technological developments and future plans with regard to our military. So I will possibly do one this year, especially since I think uh, war may be on the horizon. Maybe towards the end of this year we'll do um, a military review and we can talk about our army and our fleet. Um, it'll be a, a, a video which specifically kind of looks at that. In terms of our economy then, <coughs> the economy's going really, really well. I mean, if we're looking at domestic market sales, domestic market sales now are averaging uh, 260 to 280. Now, at the beginning of um, beginning of 1850, they were about 180 um, to 200, and this time last year, they were about 230. So we can see the growth of our, in our economy, not just in the amount of private capital domestic market sales yield, but in the total number of goods also. This also reflects well uh, in exports. At the moment, we have a, a slightly poor uh, trade balance, but that's only because we're looking to hoard manufactured goods uh, for our next manufacturing, which is going to be a textile factory. Uh, so we're looking at good economic growth. I mean, our economy is almost doubled in size in two years. So that gives an insight into what capitalist production can provide. If we actually look now um, at cereal production, is sitting at 15 based on um, our capitalist structures, all of which are open. And that slightly exceeds now the combined production of all of our smallholders. And that is only in a two-year period. I mean, at the beginning of, uh, of 1850, I don't think we maybe only had one or maybe we didn't have any um, cereal RGOs at all. Uh, so we can see now that, that the capitalist production is now beginning to supplant. I mean, capitalist production of fish is almost double, craft production. Uh, fruits is a little bit slower. We're a little bit late to the game with fruits. We, one of the reasons for that is because we had um, particularly good uh, craft production of fruits sitting at 15, and we are going to begin to expand our fruits production. The other key thing, of course, is tobacco. I was banged on about tobacco. The reason being is because tobacco... Um, we didn't have any tobacco production at all at the beginning of this period. It's a really, really lucrative cash crop. Um, it always offers really, really nice returns on investments. And tobacco, it's easy to be a bit despondent about tobacco when you think about it. I mean, our structure production is sitting at eight to nine. Um, consumption is around six, which means that uh, we're exporting two to three units per term. That's pretty small. That's very, very small, in fact. I mean, if we look at tobacco... Exports generally, um, if I can see the picture of a cigar, here we go. Tobacco product, I mean, tobacco exports of Brazil is five units. I mean, that's you know, that's nearly double uh, what we're exporting, and Brazil is an absolute backwater. You know, I mean, America 25, that's, that's fairly understandable. Uh, it's three out of the Caribbean, and then two from the West Ottoman Empire. But we should keep a sense of proportion here. We're completely new to the tobacco game. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, two years ago, didn't produce any tobacco. Furthermore, we have maxed out um, domestic consumption. We've ensured um, that tobacco domestically is sold on a quantity basis and is eminently affordable. Um, it's set at 80%, which means that anyone that, that can buy tobacco will. There will, no, there will not be any tobacco shortages in the domestic market because we always make more setting a commodity in the domestic market than we do exporting at a wholesale price. So... You know, this is good. I mean, like, uh, we're completely new to the tobacco game. The basis for tobacco being a really, really good cash crop for export is going to be partially technology. And technology, incidentally, is what boosted our cereal production slightly. Um, but it, it, it's also going to be railroads. It's going to be the application of some of that technology. Railroads, for example, connecting 
Constantinople uh, to Adrianople will probably double um, our tobacco production. Once we li link up all of our tobacco plantations uh, with the capital city, um, we're going to be looking at exporting 10 to 20 units of tobacco uh, every fortnight. And that will put us into being one of the biggest tobacco exporters in the world. And that is one of our aims economically. In terms of our agricultural policy, between now and 1860, we want to be either the, the biggest tobacco exporter in the world, or at the very least, a close second. And that would have been a really, really good concrete game uh, for our economy that we can actually look at and measure. And the capital that we get from those tobacco exports is going to be the basis for major industrial development. And going into industrial development then, um, if we look at Constantinople, we have got one textile shop um, nearing completion. Um, I think it'll probably be complete late summer, high late summer this year. And that'll uh, net us um, an additional two units of t uh, textiles um, per fortnight. Once we have railroads in place, it'll be four. And with some technological development, that'll, that'll gradually begin to increase five, six, and so on. And we can, uh, technology permitting, we'll begin to be in a position in 10 to 20 years to begin to upgrade some of these uh, RGOs, uh, or these, these manufacturers, rather. Now, I did make a bit of a snap decision, and I feel that some explanation is warranted, because in the last video, I did lay out a plan for industrial development, which really specifically focused on textile shops. And I said that I was going to be building two in Constantinople, one in Smyrna. Once we absorbed Libya, this did provide us uh, with a significant boon in terms of short-term boon in, in terms of state revenue. That reflected the fact that we sort of absorbed the public finances of Libya, or what passed for public finances in what was probably a, a very tribal society. But any kind of wealth controlled by anything resembling a state uh, is subsumed into our state revenue. We also had a couple of particularly good months um, of exports and domestic market sales, which brought our uh, capital stockpile up to 1,200. And in addition to that, we had a very large amount of manufactured goods and steel stored. And I realized that there was a very brief window to begin the construction of a very special, and very expensive kind of manufacturing. And that is a shipbuilding plant. A shipbuilding plant doesn't just require private capital. It requires about a thousand private capital, making it more expensive than any other kind of manufacturing. It also requires a hundred state funds and a very large amount of manufactured goods and steel and so on. The reason being is because, I mean, essentially you're redeveloping a large part of the city. You're kind of knocking down a huge chunk of the city, rebuilding it and turning it into something, you know, into basically a modern rationalized capitalist um, sort of uh, shipyard. And... That is what we've done. We, I realized that early on, we had a very brief window where the stars had kind of aligned in terms of, the, you know, usually with shipbuilding, there's always something that you're short of and you think, well, I have the private capital in, pl in place, let's push for a textile shop this time. And it's one of those things that's easy to put off because it does require an accumulation of a wide range of things to actually be in construction. But shipbuilding plants um, are particularly dynamic kinds of... Um, of manufacturers, their costs are quite different. Their costs require actual state revenue, um, not just not, not private capital, coal, mechanical parts, woods, textiles. Uh, it requires a, a lot of interesting and different kinds of um, commodities to maintain. But the output is manufactured goods, um, a small amount of manufactured goods, not in quite the same quantity as an actual manufactured goods factory, but a small trickle of manufactured goods. It also provides prestige, a constant trickle of prestige, and crucially, also it provides supply. Now, the Ottoman army may very well be a new kind of modern ar model army that's modeled on, on the kind of Western European tradition and this kind of thing. It has all the bells and whistles of a kind of European army, but it doesn't have, at this stage, a modern industrial kind of military complex. It doesn't have the basis to support it. We don't have armaments factories or supply factories. And furthermore, we don't have the technology to actually build those things just yet. And we are required to constantly import military supplies in order to sustain our army, making uh, our army somewhat dependent on other powers, which is, uh, for obvious reasons, not something that is desirable. So having a small trickle of supplies produced domestically is going to be important. Shipbuilding also has another really interesting dynamic feature in terms of our war ministry. Now, every loss that you experience in this game, a military loss, you actually have to 
organize beforehand replacements. You have to expend uh, officers and manpower, uh, manufacture goods, uh, in some cases private capital, if the military force, for example merchant fleets, is, is uh, privately owned, and state revenue to build replacements. And you, it won't suffice to do this once you're in the heat of battle. You have to prepare for this over a period of time. You have to build this kind of like strategic reserve up. And this isn't something that we've, we've done yet. Um, in 1850, we started with a fairly reasonable strategic reserve and we've not been committed to any significant kind of, uh, uh, any, any kind of serious war. But that is something that may change. So in the next year or two, we're going to begin to gradually enlarge our strategic reserve, particularly of line infantry, the backbone of the army, and uh, that part of the army which is most likely to experience uh, casualties. Also uh, militia, I think, conscripts. Now the really expensive replacement, as you can imagine, are warship parts. Heavy ship parts are eye-wateringly expensive. And again, you need to have these prepared beforehand, really, so that when ships sustain damage, they can go back to port. It requires a large military port for these ships to be um, to be repaired, patched up. And ships are something that are only going to get more and more expensive during this period. This is the end of the age of sail, really. Yeah, many of our ships do have auxiliary sails. Um, but they also have screws. We can see the ships that have screws. They have a little kind of like a smokestack. And so these ships have auxiliary sails, but the main propulsion actually comes from this screw, like modern ships, and will have a kind of uh, some form of kind of combustion engine uh, which drives that. And at this time, of course, that would be coal coal powered. Uh, but they still have sails. They still have auxiliary sails. Within a decade or two from now, we're going to be ironcladding ships, which is very expensive. It makes ships much more expensive, much stronger, much more effective. And then after that, we're going to be looking at steel ships. So ships are something that are only going to become more expensive. And having replacement parts are fantastic. Now, what shipyards do is randomly create replacement parts. Um, and it isn't something that's fixed or that you can control, and it's not something that's guaranteed. Also, they, uh, they uh, create some private repair parts for your merchant ships as well. It's a really, really good feature. And the fact that you get a constant trickle of prestige from them as well, once you get these laid down earlier on, it becomes easier later on to then build this shipyard up and modernize it and adapt it so that it can um, deal with more modern ships like, you know, like um, ironclad ships and that sort of thing. So I'm quite glad that we got this construction in really early. Um, our plan actually this year is still to add to that. We're going to try and add another textile uh, factory in Constantinople and then a third textile factory we're hoping to get in, in Smyrna by the end of the year. That is a push. That means that this year we would have begun the construction of, uh, of uh, three um, modern manufactories, and we would have completed one. But that would be um, that would be a, a substantial kind of um, boost in economic growth. Hopefully, this year also, resources and private capital permitting, we're going to be looking to exploit these last two regions for tobacco plantations. We can build two tobacco plantations in northern Bulgaria. That will increase our um, tobacco production by probably another couple of units at this stage. Another couple of units per fortnight. So the economy is looking good. It's looking really, really healthy. Um, uh, inflation has remained um, stable at 2%. And um, our asset stock is probably about twice what it was a year ago. Uh, so we've got a nice stockpile of assets. And as I say, in every, in every kind of area, domestic consumption is gradually increasing. So... Good news there. I should report really quickly. I mean, last year we had a very small rebellion in, in the Jaff. Uh, this was about a thousand kind of uh, sort of camel warriors. They were very quickly and easily dealt with. Uh, Kershid is obviously no longer, uh, not Kershid, uh, Hussein Avenue is no longer with uh, the Baghdad division. Um, but we have had reports that Kut, there's a rebellion happening in Kut. We can see the military control only sits at 71%. So we're going to... Um, send um, our Baghdad infantry, infantry Division south. We, uh, it's, it doesn't have a commander, an elite commander, so it is going to experience um, a 30% combat penalty. It's only under the, the leadership of very junior localized officers, and it moves a little bit slower. But we're hoping, nevertheless, it's a force of, what, uh, 15,000 men. We're hoping that is sufficient to deal with what is likely going to be a very, very small um, kind of rebellion there. Not much else to report, actually. I think that probably... Um, Settles it for uh, March um, 1852. Uh, next report will probably be um, in June 1852. We'll provide a kind of another quarterly report and update on um, any events and developments. Unless, of course, there is some kind of major crisis, some sort of significant event that happens between now and then. 
Uh, thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.